Can we talk about nuclear weapons just for a little bit? Uh, so fission is the kind of reaction that's central to the nuclear weapons we have today? That's what sets them off. That's what sets them off. So if we look at the hydrogen bomb, maybe you can say how these yeah. different weapons work. So the earliest nuclear weapons, the, the, the nuclear bombs that were dropped on Japan, et cetera, et cetera, were pure fission weapons. They used uh, enriched uranium or plutonium, and their energy is essentially entirely derived from fission reactions. But um, it was early realized that more energy was available if one could somehow combine a fission bomb with um, fusion reactions. Um, because the fusion reactions give more energy per unit mass than uh, than fission reactions. And these were this was called the super. You might have heard of the expression the super, or more simply, hydrogen bombs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, bombs which use isotopes of hydrogen and the fusion reactions associated with them. But like you said, it's hard to turn on. It's hard to turn on because you need very high temperatures and you need confinement of that long enough for the reactions to take place. And so a bomb, actually a, th a thermonuclear bomb or a hydrogen bomb, um, has essentially a chemical implosion which then sets off a fission explosion, which then sets off and compresses hydrogen isotopes and other things, which I don't know because I don't. I've never had a security clearance. Okay, so I <laughs> so I can't betray any secrets about <laughs> weapons because I've never been a party to them. But because I know a lot about this problem, I can guess. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and and sets off fusion reactions in the middle. Okay, so that's basically, it's that sequence of things which produce these enormous, you know, multi-megaton uh, bombs that have very large yields. Um, and so fusion alone can't get, can't get you there. there. It is actually possible to set off or to try to set off little fusion bombs alone without the surrounding uh, fission explosion. And that is what is called laser fusion. So another approach to fusion, which actually is mostly uh, researched in the weapons complex, the national labs and so forth, because it's more associated with the technologies of, of weapons, is inertial fusion. So if, in, if you decide instead of trying to make your plasma just sit there in this torus in the, in the tokamak and be controlled steady state with a magnetic field. If, you, if you're willing to accept that I'll just set off an explosion, okay, and then I'll gather the energy from that somehow. I don't quite know how, but let's not ask that question too much. Um, then um, it is possible to imagine generating fusion alone explosions. And, and the way you do it is you take some small amount of deuterium tritium fuel, you bombard it with uh, energy from all sides, and this is what the lasers are used for, extremely powerful lasers, which compresses the, pe the pellet of fusion and heats it. It compresses it to such a high density and temperature that the reactions take place very, very quickly. And in fact, they can take place so quickly that they're, it's all over with before the thing flies apart. Okay. Wow. And that so is heated up really fast. That is inertial fusion. Okay. Is that useful for energy generation for no, outside? <laughs> not yet. I mean, there are those people who think it will be, but you may have heard of the big experiment called the National Ignition Facility, which was built at Livermore starting in the late 1990s and has been in operation since mm, around about 2010. It was designed in, with the claim that it would reach ignition, fusion ignition, in this pulsed form where the reactions are got over with so quickly before the thing, whole thing flies apart. It didn't actually reach ignition, and it doesn't look as if it will, although you know we never know. Maybe people will figure out how to make it work better. Um, but 
the answer is, in principle, it seems possible to reach ignition uh, in this way, maybe not with that particular laser facility. Are you surprised that uh, we humans haven't destroyed ourselves, <laughs> given that we've invented such powerful tools of destruction? Like, what do you make of the, the fact that for many decades we've had nuclear weapons now? Speaking about estimating risk, at least to me, it's exceptionally surprising. I was born in the Soviet Union, that um, that big egos of the big leaders, when uh, rubbing up against each other, have not created uh, the kind of destruction one was af everybody was afraid of for decades. Well, I must say, I'm extremely thankful that it hasn't. I don't know whether I'm surprised about it. Um, I've never thought about it in, from the point of view of, is it surprising that we've we've avoided it? I'm just very thankful that we have. I think that there is a sense in which cooler heads have prevailed at crucial moments. I think there is also a sense in which, you know, mutually assured destruction um, has in fact worked um, as a policy to restrain the great powers from going to war. And in fact, you know, the 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 fact that we haven't had a world war, you know, since the 1940s is perhaps even attributable to nuclear weapons in a kind of strange and peculiar way. But I think humans are deeply uh, flawed and sinful people, and I certainly don't feel that we're guaranteed that it's going to go on like this.